All right. Good evening again, everybody. How's everybody doing tonight? Yay! Wonderful. However, however, I must tell you, it's already day four. Oh. But to cheer us up, we have a great last talk for today here at Milliways. By the way, the Fediverse hashtag, as always, is hashtag CCCamp23 Milliways. And uh, who here in the crowd owns a vacuum robot? I would say not great, not terrible, but um, oh wow, I didn't expect that from like a hacker crowd. So then, especially for those of you who own one, the next talk is for you. In the next 45 minutes, our speaker, Dennis Gieser, will tell us all the latest news about vacuum robots, their security and their privacy issues, so that hopefully in the end, your robot will not suck your data. Please give a warm welcome to Dennis and enjoy the talk. All right, um, welcome to my talk. Uh, thank you very much for being here at this late time. Um, it's great that you had four days of camp. I mean, I came a little bit late uh, because I had some stuff to do, and, uh, but it's kind of great here, except for a little bit warm. So, um, my talk today is uh, kind of like an update about uh, vacuum re um, robot uh, security and privacy. And I know people think like, oh, wait, that's always the same topic every two years. But um, I mean, there's a lot of development, so you know, let's do a quick update. Um, so, for people who don't know me, um, which is the slides are kind of a little bit broken. Um, I'm a PhD student at Northeastern University, uh, and I'm, uh, primarily my research field is in uh, wireless and embedded security and privacy. Um, I think due to the amount of many, many robots, uh, vacuum robots which I have, I can call myself a vacuum robot collector. So I, have, I think like nowadays like something like 45 robots. And I um, have interest in the reverse engineering of interesting devices. And this can be, can be anything. I mean, robots, obviously. But I have also like um, smart speakers, um, you know, look at flash memory and other things. Let me quickly ask, uh, is the format kind of weird a little bit? <laughs> is this my laptop? <laughs> Okay, let me uh, fix that maybe real quick. <laughs> How many security experts do we need to fix issues? Okay. Uh. Yeah, the, the laptop is not smart now. Ah, okay, great. <laughs> All right, perfect. Uh, keep working with experts, that's great. Okay, so. Um, like I said, I am interested in vacuum robots, smart speakers, and all other interesting IoT devices. Um, some of my recent work is, um, I, some time ago, I was looking at uh, Amazon smart, smart speakers, like Echo Dots, and I bought like um, 86 used Echo Dots from eBay, from other sources like Kleinanzeigen in Germany. I was doing some forensics, and let's say it was very bad news for Amazon. So uh, if you have used IoT devices, don't sell them, or bad people like me might buy them. Um, some other recent projects, I do a lot of flash forensics. Um, for example, on the left you see like the uh, Pixel Watch, but um, I look at embedded devices and see what kind of data I can extract from flash memory, but also look at flash memory itself. Uh, surprisingly, a lot of flash memories have the, their own processor on them, and you can hack the flash firmware to maybe do malicious things, so this is kind of like a current research project of me. Um, another thing which I run, is uh, robotinfo.dev, um, which is basically a website where I do a systematic analysis of robots. Um, for example, which operation system they're running, what kind of sensors they have, if they have vulnerabilities or not. Um, the primary uh, focus of that site is more or less to look at uh, security and privacy. Um, and what I use it also for, kind of like in the back end, to track firmware changes. So basically, every time there's a new firmware update, uh, there's an automatic process which downloads it, extracts it, and you know compares it. So we kind of get an idea what the vendors are doing. Um, 
one of the sources uh, how I get all this information is basically by buying devices, disassembling them, and kind of start to emulating them. So there's, I have like something like uh, 50 or 60 emulated vacuum robots, which are kind of behaving like real robots to the cloud and kind of just look like, okay, do we get like pushed firmware updates? Uh, is there anything new? Um, but also on the other side, what we do is like we take a look at the app. So we d decompile the app and look like if anything changes. Um, this is also like basis for further research. I mean, for example, right now I'm working on also machine learning models and some other things. Um, by the way, the rack which you see there is like one of my few racks of robots. So I keep like um, a set of robots from uh, uh, basically a reference model from each of the models which we support uh, for routing. And every time there's a new firmware update or if I need to check something, I just go to that rack and just grab one and test my the things which I need to test and just put it back. Um, which also means, and I get this question quite often also on Twitter on, or X um, or uh, via email like, oh, hey, I want to buy a vacuum robot, which cleans the best? <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. I root those devices, but I mean, I'm not actually using them except for one which I use and it does the job good enough. So I have no idea. So don't ask me about which one is the best for cleaning X, Y, and Z. All right. So. Um, what is the goal of this talk? Um, well, I want to give you an um, overview over the development of the vacuum robot hacking over the last uh, five years. And I um, want to give you like some idea about vulnerabilities and backdoors which uh, exist today. Um, and give you some understanding about which uh, routing methods we have. Um, the automotive goal typically which I have is to get root access onto a device without disassembly. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, but um, you know. We, tr we try our best to find ways and sneak ways around to kind of get root access. Um, as a side note, generally, um, we have um, some, I mean, uh, me and the, the, the vendors don't hate each other necessarily, but the thing is, uh, we have a very competitive kind of setting. So every time they fix something, we fix something, and it's kind of like always competitive thing. So I, I know, for example, when I was giving this talk at DEF CON, that they were watching live, and right now we're probably working on, on firmware updates. So, um, yeah. So some of the devices which I covered in this talk, um, they are the, the, the current uh, Roborock vac vacuum robots. Um, some of them just came out kind of very recently. Um, they are more or less all the dreamy robots, like all the new generation, like our generation vacuum robots. We have also a new uh, routing method for all the older ones, which came li out like one and a half years and before that. So the so-called P models. Um, and every, everything you see here can be also technically applied to other um, robots, for example, uh, the Naval robots, which are more f used in America, uh, Shark uh, AI robots, and also some lawnmowers like the Zegway. Um, everything which is like underlined is basic, are basically robots which have like cameras which you can access in one way or the other. Um, Right. Uh, as a general thing, is I mean, why we j uh, just as a comment, kind of why we jumping around on Roborock and Dreamy? Why not iRobot? The thing is, um, surprisingly, Roborock and Dreamy have like some of the best value propositions in terms of like features and price. While iRobot nowadays, they're very, very good in like reducing the uh, amount of hardware which we put into the devices so to make it barely work for the use case which it's used to, which means it doesn't make any sense to root them because we don't have any resources anymore to run our own stuff on them. So. There's a particular reason why, I mean, technically I have rooted these devices, but I'm not touching them, basically. Okay, so uh, about the stock. Um, the result which you see here will be basically the result of uh, 15 months of research and experiments, which is a little bit annoying in the sense of like, if you're sitting for this long time on kind of, I wouldn't say zero days, it sounds always like very important, but uh, on vulnerabilities, which you can't tell anyone and disclose to anyone because basically as soon as they get burned, they basically get burned. Um, this talk is a collaborative effort with um, me and Zorn Bayer, and Zorn Bayer is like, the developer of uh, Vanetudo. Traditionally, we had this, uh, the separation of um, me doing all the routing part and all the hardware stuff, and he's like, basically taking care of the cloud replacement, Vanetudo. Nowadays, we're kind of like, you know, uh, he's also like going into the routing part because that's the cooler part, and you know, he wants to enjoy his life too. So. Um, we would be also here if it wouldn't be the, uh, if it wasn't the community. So a lot of people from the community support us by uh, testing routing methods, uh, giving feedback to about software, catching things which we messed up potentially, uh, donating devices, donating uh, money. So there's like a lot of support from the community. Um, the um, typically what we do is like we don't disclose things to the vendors, so the vendors are kind of uh, unaware of the findings. Well, technically not today because I gave this talk basically at DevCon like five days ago, so they basically weren't aware five days ago, and we didn't see any updates so far. So we, 
um, are still working on that, I assume. Um, but expect like uh, firmware updates and patches over the next couple of days, I assume. Okay, so what's the motivation of this talk? So why the heck do we want to root devices? Um, well, one of the things is, for me at least, when I started that, is like to play with cool hardware. Um, these devices are very powerful. It's basically, uh, imagine of a Raspberry Pi or a smartphone on, on tires, very compact, driving around here in your house. So it's a very interesting platform for, for devices. Uh, the other thing is, because it's so powerful, um, I want to um, basically stop the devices from constantly phoning home. Um, and phoning home is kind of a thing with these devices, so you can expect a couple hundred megabytes per month in telemetry data, pictures, whatever. Um, the other thing is, um, if people l want to use custom software like Home Assistant, it's very, very difficult um, to integrate these devices in, in that system um, without relying on the cloud. And sometimes the cloud can also go down, so there's a lot of like kind of kind of problems. Um, one thing become, which becomes more and more important nowadays is um, diagnosis of broken devices. Um, this is not necessarily, I mean, it's still an issue in, in, in Europe, uh, but in America you have a warranty period of one year, and these devices tend to break exactly after one year. Uh, and so a lot of people in the U.S. have the issue, like, okay, um, you know, we cannot let it get, get it repaired over under warranty, so we need to find a different way, and we can help out people by, you know, diagnosing like what kind of things might be break, might be broken. Um, and the a thing which is related to my research is basically to verify the privacy claims um, of the vendors. So, why do we don't trust the great companies who develop these nice IoT products? Well. If you think about these devices, these devices are directly connected to your home network and can talk to everything typically in in your home and have like uh, some internet connection. Um, I know people put uh, some people put them in some VLANs and stuff like that, but I mean let's be realistic. Most like 99% of the users probably just put them in their normal Wi-Fi and call it a day. Um, the communication to the cloud is uh, encrypted, and you have no idea what the content is. Um, also. Even if the vendor is not malicious, uh, developing secure hardware and software is hard. So nothing says that the vendor can't get hacked at one day or that there's some weird kind of vulnerability in the device which can be used uh, remotely. Um, if you remember the Murray botnet um, many, many years ago, which basically where IP cameras got hacked from the internet and create like a huge botnet. So we want to kind of figure out if there's like, some hidden vulnerabilities which the vendor didn't put in on purpose but which exist there. Um, and one of the things why I'm, I'm a little bit paranoid is because uh, vendor claims might contradict each other. So I have a, my favorite go-to example for uh, claims of vendors, and I use always Roborock, but technically all the other vendors do more or less the same thing. Roborock claimed for the um, S6 Max V, like, hey, um, it's built for privacy, it's certified by the TÜV, my favorite company. Um, nothing is ever duplicated, nothing is ever stored, nothing is ever sent to the cloud. The cameras are only used for AI detection. It never leaves the robot. Everything is fine. Don't trust us, please. But if you scroll down a little bit more, it says, like, by the way, you can watch your pet remotely from, from your phone and can talk to it, and you can see like what go what's going on in your home, and you can drive around in your home and basically watch if that everything is okay. So now the question is like, okay, on one side, no nothing is ever sent to the cloud, and it's not possible to access the camera remotely, like basically upload pictures, but on the other side, you can access it remotely. So what is it? Um, as a side note, I mean, there's different ways to interpret what the exact thing is, but I mean, it's very, very unclear here. Um, the other thing is, um, iRobot got recently caught how they uploaded uh, pictures of users, of, well, of development devices basically, which they gave away for free to users um, to the cloud and where they used gig workers in Venezuela to kind of label them, um, which was a little bit um, unsettling because most of the users didn't realize that it's somewhere hidden in the terms of service that the pictures will be used by people and um, some people, uh, some pictures which were uploaded were like people sitting on the toilet, naked kids, whatever, you can, you can be creative. Um, I have some examples uh, from the t MIT Tech Review article. Um, I was helping the journalists like, to figure out which device it is because I have like, from all the devices to camera perspective, so I really quickly figured out that's iRobot. And it turned out to be actually iRobot. And the question is, like, why do they need to know what kind of AC you have, what kind of switches you have, and everything else? So this is like basically um, the stuff which was labeled in Venezuela from um, the gig workers. Um, as a small fun fact, as soon as the article came out, or as soon as the journalists actually started to send out like requests to all the vendors and asking about them, that things, um, s many of the vendors panicked and started to change their uh, firmware apps and also privacy policies. So you see a lot of privacy policies being changed uh, around November, December 2022, which is kind of interesting. 
Um, the other thing, which is some motivation for me also, these, these, these kind of devices have more and more sensors. So, I mean, at some point we got cameras, which is kind of bad. But nowadays, some of the robots have even microphones. And one of the things which I want to mention here is like when, when we started five years ago, we were kind of joking like, okay, we tried to find a way to use the ultrasonic, sonic, ultrasonic sensor to basically listen to people, or maybe you can use like some, some other sensor to kind of spy on people. But nowadays, we don't need to do that. The, the, the robots come with um, microphones themselves. Um, as a quick note, I know there's some papers out there which claim that you can use the ladder to uh, snoop on people by flashing the firmware and stuff like that, but I can tell you today that it's not possible that the paper is more or less not accurate. So I know it's out there, but the shock, shocker in academia, people might be not super accurate what papers are. So you cannot use the ladder as, as, a, as a microphone, just as a hint. All right, so what are risks of devices with cameras? Well, some of the devices might store pictures indefinitely. Sad news is also a lot of them do, both in cloud and locally. There are some ways how I, how I was able to figure that out. Um, so far, I can't tell you exactly which companies they are, but uh, there are some. Um, also, if you buy um, used devices from, for example, Amazon Marketplace, you need to be a little bit careful. Um, you don't know what was installed previously on the device. So um, the previous user might have installed a rootkit. The new owner uh, cannot verify the, the, the software, and as a result, you might have a malicious device in your network. So we are in a hacker conference, and I just want to say it's, it's super illegal to do that, so don't do that. Don't buy devices on Amazon and you know, root them, put some rootkit onto that, and send it back to Amazon. That's very root and probably illegal, I assume. I hope so, at least. OK, so rooting is more or less the only way how you know that the device is clean, in a way. So. Um, one of the things um, which is kind of interesting, especially in Germany, from like some German press articles, um, some vendors got a little bit car uh, car no, no, not curious, um, got a little bit creative in sense of like users which are um, privacy aware, and they try to avoid the word camera as far as they can, and instead they try to use the optical, like the word optical sensor. And I have here an article from Golem. Um, I don't want to shame Golem, but I mean, many, many, many do that. And they kind of asked the vendor, and the vendor said, like, oh, yeah, optical sensor is, is accurate. So I, I'm, it's not a shaming thing, it's just like an info thing here. So what Roboro kind of said is, like, oh, so we don't have cameras in there. For privacy reasons, we put, just put an optical sensor which detects lasers. So it's, it's privacy, uh, it's good for your privacy, so don't worry, everything will be fine. And I have an output of the optical sensor on the right. <laughs> uh, by the way, so sorry, it says hello, DEF CON, but. Uh, I was too lazy to create another picture for that. So yeah, so as you see, that's an output of an optical sensor, so no camera involved. Nothing to see here, right. Also, certifications are very important. Um, most of the devices which are, um, have cameras have like some kind of certification, either by TÜV Rheinland or by TÜV um, Zoot, so both of them are kind of testing all the devices and uh, you know all these devices met the European cybersecurity um, standards. So I think we can enter talk here because all of them are secure, I assume, because you know they got tested. Yeah. Um, sadly, yeah, we can't end here. All right. So what happened so far? Let me give you a quick rundown here. G um, let's start with a general observation, like what we saw in the last five years. So every time we get uh, we release a routing method, uh, the vendors react in weird, sometimes different ways. So sometimes um, they even react in a way that they break things. And there was like um, some case where they pushed a very quick firmware update, which started to break hundreds of vacuum robots, like permanently, because they kind of started to panic and started to, to do weird things, which is kind of sad, um, which uh, we want to avoid, obviously. Um, the best case for us if we react is that our routing method just fails in a way that it says like, hey, uh, the file system is, is broken, we don't accept it, we don't boot it, so uh, whatever. That's the best case. So um, sadly, some vendors started to do things which are a little bit more mean. Um, the routing succeeds, everything is fine, but the devi device will break randomly. For example, while, while it cleans, at some point it will just crash and you know it's very hard to debug. In particular cases, it's also so if it detects manipulations or like rooted firmware, it will just destroy itself permanently. So it will just delete its, key, its keys and you know, uh, it will be kind of like a problem. So that's the reason why we need to buy the devices in advance to kind of figure stuff like that out. So let's start with the first work in 2017. Um, this was a work together with Danny Wigemer. Um, 
and it was about the uh, Xiaomi uh, first generation and the Roborock uh, S5, which is also kind of like the first generation device back then. Um, some of the findings which we found were that the firmware images are unsigned and only encrypted with a very weak key. And I think the very weak key was like just Roborock as the name of the company. This by itself wouldn't be a big issue. The problem is that you could push custom firmware on the local network. And so basically you could just flash the device, you know, over network. Um, Th this is not necessarily a problem for us of people who want to root the devices, but it's a bigger problem if you have like malicious people who want to do bad things. Now, people might say like, okay, I don't have access. Uh, so typically, attackers don't have access to your personal network. The problem is if your device is in unprovisioning mo uh, in, in provisioning mode, basically. So if it opens its own Wi-Fi access point and waits you for like pushing it into your private Wi-Fi, then you can do the same pushing. Uh, like basically, you can push the firmware onto that too. Um, when I was living in uh, in Darmstadt, I saw some of my neighbors had like Xiaomi vacuum robots, which were paranoid. They didn't put them into their Wi-Fi, so they had wi open Wi-Fi access points on the robot. And I didn't do it, but technically, I could have, you know, pushed like a malicious firmware onto that and just wait one day. They will probably put it in, your, in their Wi-Fi, and then they would be screwed. Still, don't do that. If you see unprovisioned robots in your neighborhood, don't hack them. That's very mean and annoying. Anyway, so what's the result of these two facts? Um, one of the things is we could uh, root the devices for this assembly, and we could start the development of custom software and voice packages. Uh, a lot of people in Germany apparently are very f you know, interested in voice packages. Um, I mean, for me, English is fine, but um, you know, a lot of people got very creative uh, with like uh, GLaDOS and some other things. Um, this was published in, on the um, uh, CCC Congress in uh, 2017 and also DEFCON in 2018, so exactly five years ago. So as you see, I do that stuff for a very long time already. Um, the reaction from that was Roborock, who developed both these both this devices, was not very happy about that. So what they started to do is like they started to block local firmware updates uh, on in the firmware, which is technically okay from a cybersecurity perspective. So I wasn't super mad about that. But also then what we started to introduce is they basically st signed all the firmware and voice packages, so we couldn't necessarily create the, our own anymore. And each of the devices, uh, each of the device models, basically use different encryption keys. So we had to basically get every device individually, uh, like every model, uh, and extract the keys to kind of you know look in the firmware. One of the things where we got a little bit annoyed about people buying cheap devices in China and using them in Europe uh, was basically that they um, started to enforce region locks, so that you couldn't import the device anymore, and uh, that you can can't run them, you know, in Germany because uh, for whatever reason. I mean, we just want to avoid that. Um, however, one of the interesting things is, um, is uh, that the hardware mostly remains the same. So if you, buy, um, if you bought every two years a vacuum robot from Roborock and you take the PCBs out and compare them to each other, the layout is more or less the same. So they sell you the more or less the same hardware configuration all over again every two years or every, uh, every year even. So it's like that's their business model, I guess. They can't charge you for updates, but they can charge you for new hardware, just as a side note. Anyway, uh, the problem which we had now is like we needed to disassemble the device, which was kind of like a problem. Um, I have here an example. So basically, you need to completely unscrew the device. You need to solder maybe a few things. Um, the, one of the good things here was um, that um, this, this method, uh, so we figured out a way to kind of bypass that, so which required this assembly. And this worked for the robot S6, S, S5 Max, S, S7, and also others. Um, the initial idea which we had was uh, that we accessed the U-Boot shell by UART. Um, sadly, we figured that out at some point and fixed that. And the new approach was uh, that we get the device into bootloader mode and just p patch the file system over USB. And this uh, turned out to be the more um, efficient way to do that. Um, again, the disadvantage is we need to disassemble the device, which kind of is annoying, but I mean, that's the, way, that's the price of doing business, I guess. One of the interesting facts is that this method still works until today um, for all the Alvinor R16 based devices. So, for example, S6 Pro Ultra, uh, sorry, S7 Pro Ultra, and Q7. Um, when they saw that we have a new way to, to root the devices, they reacted again and were not necessarily happy. So, as mentioned before, they locked the bootloader down, so we don't have a Uber show anymore. And then they basically got through the book of like all security methods and started to introduce things like Secure Boot, SA Linux. Um, they introduced the M Verity, and even newer devices have uh, encrypted looks file, uh, looks encrypted file systems, uh, where the user data and application is encrypted. So we can't even figure out like okay, what is the application actually doing? So we only see like partial of this, the p portion of the system. And they start to use, uh, started to use uh, Trust Zone, where they store the keys in, uh, in Opti basically, which 
has also the risk if you do any sketchy things where the keys just get wiped. Uh, so you need to be careful with that. Um, one thing which we introduced at some point were uh, custom elf binary signatures, which I never saw before. So we basically s we're assigning all elf, elf binaries which exist in the system. And every time you try to execute like an um, unsigned binary, it just wouldn't execute. It would get a sec fault. So in tr uh, 2021, um, we fight back. Um, so this was a thing which I um, presented at um, Def. Oh, it presented. Oh, this is actually not accurate. I think I, that's a, I presented the DEFCON, uh, DEFCON 21, uh, not here. Um, and the, um, the method was basically to bypass uh, the ELF binary ver uh, verification and the security. So one of the ideas was to uh, modify um, the configuration partition, but it required basically the desoldering of the EMMC flash chip, so which most of the people can do or don't want to do because it will very likely break your device or you need some ISP access. So this was a very specific method for a very specifically um, specific people who are good with soldering, but it's not a you know broad thing. And um, that was the reason why we said like, okay, we want to maybe t take a look at different vendors for now and just you know wait until Roborock kind of cools down and kind of gets more relaxed and you know starts stops being mean. And one thing which we found where uh, was a new vendor which is Dreamy. And we were very similar devices to Roborock. Basically, we were powerful. They were had cameras. Um, they had an extremely easy routing method, basically, before disassembling. Um, and we were able to basically um, flash them over USB. One of the problems with the flashing over USB part was that some devices got soft bricked, but um, I think we solved that problem nowadays. So, how did Roborock react onto our DEF CON talk back then? Well, I got a very nice email from the Roborock CEO. One day after my talk, I, like, oh, thank you for the talk. Our engineers watch the talk live and are fixing right now all the vulnerabilities. So that's the reason why I know that they we're, are watching these talks. Um, what we did now is like they encrypted all the partitions except the system partition, which we can't do for uh, technical reasons. Um, they started to obfuscate the ELF binary signature verification, so we cannot find it that easily and patch it. And uh, we started to add custom code into random libraries to kind of detect if we try to bypass the traffic. So one of the ways how we kind of uh, disconnect devices from the cloud is that we redirect the traffic via DNS uh, to, them, to the robot itself so that uh, basically nothing goes to the cloud, everything stays on the robot. And they figured out like, hey, hmm, do you still want to exfiltrate traffic from the robot? So how can we do that? We just have a detection which detects if you have a, um, if you want to upload something to your roborock.com um, domain. And if you do that, it has like some obfuscated way to kind of do DNS queries on itself in a libcurl library. So um, at some point we noticed like, wait, we have still traffic going to off uh, to Roborock, even though that we have you know blocked all the domains. And so we figured out that we introduced like some sneaky way to still exfiltrate log files and some other stuff, even if the device is is, um, is rooted. So we figured it out. We patch it nowadays. But this is like one of the things they we they try to find ways to bypass our routing methods. Um, and nowadays they uh, love obfuscation, like they use X or like everywhere they can use it. So it's kind of like it's it's um, gets a little bit annoying from time to time. So um, how does their stuff look like? So um, they, as, as mentioned, they nowadays check uh, for for elf signatures in the kernel. So uh, basically, they use the do mm map function. Um, which basically creates like a memory area, I think, for if you start start uh, try to run a program, and if the file is not signed correctly, it will basically sec forward. So every time you try to execute your own custom binary, it will just sec forward. Nothing happens. Um, and they got really creative um, in naming that function. So I have an example on the right, which is uh, basically the do nm function from um, the S8. And uh, we started to use fun uh, names like clock set rate DSP0. There's no DSP0, by the way, or clock set whatever thing. So these functions are actually just to verify the signature, but they named them in, in the super weird way so that we would think like, oh, that's probably something important, so we don't touch it. But in reality, that's where obfuscated uh, signature check. And they do some, some weird other stuff. So I think they use some uh, code obfuscation tools to kind of basically try to get us off track. So at the same time, Jamie started also to panic uh, directly after the talk. Uh, so they did a lot of changes in their firmware. They removed the UART uh, UBoot shell, uh, sorry, the UART um, lock-in shell and the UBoot shell. So they just patched UBoot. Um, and they pushed changes, which started to apparently to break uh, robots if their firmware uh, version was too old. So it was kind of weird. So uh, we got a lot of feedback back from people who didn't have rooted vacuum robots, but their device was bricked from like a firmware update. 
Um, and especially this happened outside of the warranty, so they're kind of perma brick devices. Um, one of the fun facts is because we compared firmware updates, we found a way simpler routing method which we weren't aware of. So they patched something where uh, we, we didn't know that it was there, and it was very helpful because one thing which we noticed is that they, they removed this function. Um, and what it does is if you press the reset button for one second, it will pop a login shell. Um, and we had no idea because we thought, like, okay, we removed the login shell, so we, we need to do the USB and whatever. Uh, and then we noticed, like, wait, they, they removed that. And it took, like, many, many months until it w got actually pushed into, um, like, all the devices which were newly produced. And we saw that and we were like, oh, wait, there's a, more, there's a way safer method because now you can connect over UART, press the reset button for one second, and just get a login shell, and you can log in with um, a particular password. So. Uh, this was very helpful, so thanks for showing us this uh, thing. This is not the only time it has happened, so we found a couple other things which were also kind of kind of useful. Right, um, but we started to panic even more, and we introduced like a secure boot and uh, s have set the secu uh, the fuses, which was kind of ex being expected. Um, we signed the um, uh, system partition and are doing the verification over a U-boot, which is the bootloader. And they started to pair the, the kernel with a particular version of the system partition. Um, and this is kind of important for, for the thing which we did next. Um, they basically um, introduced uh, introduce the judge countermeasurements. So judge counter countermeasurements, what, what, what is that? Um, this is one of the things uh, which we introduced in uh, 2020 in all new firmware. So if you have a firmware which is newer uh, than, uh, or a device also which is newer than 2022, you have it. Um, Rooted firmware would start crash randomly, um, and it was super weird for us to to debug that. And uh, at the end of the day, we figured it out. But this was like super annoying, and it was super mean by them. And I think it was directed directly at us. Uh, this was not a thing against other vendors. It was directly directed at us. So what does it do? So they bake the expected SHA-256 hash of the root file system into the kernel. Then, as soon as you start, uh, as soon as you run the cleaning process, at some random time in that cleaning process, it will compute the hash of the actual system partition, compared if it matches to the hash which the kernel expects. If the hash is not correct, they will just start spawning new threads and uh, run malloc in a loop, which will basically cause that the whole memory, uh, that you get a memory leak basically, uh, randomly. This can be after five minutes, this can be after ten minutes, but the robot will at some point crash and just stop at some point. And this is extremely difficult to debug because, I mean, the thing is, so there's no locks. Uh, no, no locks. Uh, you cannot run like trace the whole time because it just happens randomly. So at some point we, we figured it out, but this was like extremely annoying and, and, and cost me like weeks of like reverse engineering and like figuring out what's going on and basically comparing firmwares. Why it doesn't crash with this firmware, why it crashes with this firmware, what, what changed, uh, which, is, which, which is very sad. Anyway. So that was the past. Uh, we figured it out. Uh, so let's talk about the current state of robot security. Um, I want to just use one device, which I think is like the, the one which has the most protections and is the most secure one, and that's the Roborock S8 Pro Ultra. Um, that's uh, uh, the, the, the current flagship model by Roborock. So that's the newest kind of thing which we have. <coughs> um, this device runs a, a all winner um, MR8 13. Uh, which is a quad core sock and runs uh, like a couple more MCUs. It has either 512 megabyte of RAM or one gigabyte of RAM. The reason why we have two different things is I think they started with one gigabyte and figured out they can get away with 512. So it's kind of like a cut, uh, cost cutting measurement. And um, they have four gigabyte of flash. Um, this device has two cameras, uh, one LiDAR sensor and two line lasers. So it's kind of interesting from a platform. And security-wise, we checked everything in the book. Basically, secure boot, DM verity protect root of S, everything encrypted, S A Linux, and ELF signatures. Um, all right, I want to give you a short rundown um, about the uh, boot process of the uh, S eight Ultra. Um, it looks a little bit complicated, uh, but it's important to kind of understand that for our uh, attack. Let me just get a quick drink here. All right. So, um, we start at the boot ROM, which is basically baked into the SOC. Uh, the boot ROM checks the um, baked in uh, hash, which is like in the effuses of the, of the um, TOC0, which is like kind of like the first stage bootloader. Uh, this first stage bootloader initializes also the RAM, so from there we can do other things. Then TOC0, or like first stage bootloader, checks the signature of TOC1, which is like a technical term here. 
which launches uh, the secure uh, the uh, trust zone component, which is opt, which then verifies and launches uBoot. Um, you would guess it's um, a boot configuration, then verifies and launches the actual Linux kernel. The Linux kernel has baked in the DM Verity key, which will basically verify and mount the root file system. And the Linux kernel has also the ELF binary signature thing, which will uh, basically check all the init, uh, init software which will be launched up after that. The init software itself will talk again to Trust Zone and will get the keys for the partitions and will start to decrypt the, part the software partition and will decrypt the user data partition. So basically what this means is everything checked everything else, so which is kind of an issue. Well, or does it? Uh, so the question is like, is everything actually checked by everything? Well, there's one thing which is a little bit questionable, and this is like the, the U-boot portion. So what is U-boot? Um, it's the de facto uh, default bootloader for embedded devices, so you find it in all the embedded devices models. It's very powerful software. Um, it does some setup of hardware. Um, it sets also the command line arguments for the kernel. It ver verifies the kernel and boots it. And uh, the important thing here is it uses like an environment to configure itself. And why we need to use this environment is like if you do firmware updates, you don't want to do it on the operation system which you're running right now. You want to kind of do it on a copy and then just switch to copy. So you need to have like some mechanism to switch between both. Um, so this is like the AB booting. Um, and it supports a very com powerful command set. For example, it allows you to loading partitions into memories, which you need for, for the kernel load. It allows you to access memory and it allows you also to check me uh, change memory. So access memory and changing memory. Hmm, can we do anything with that? Well, the question is like, can we ask U-Boot very nicely to just modify itself? And so the theory would be here, well, can we use the read and write commands to override instructions in the sense of can we just patch the signature functions? And so what we need to do here is like we need to do a little bit of math. So uh, we need to figure out where the signature function is actually in the memory. Uh, we need to figure out where U-Boot is basically relocating itself, which is the kind of technical thing which U-Boot is doing. And we need to calculate the exact place in memory. And then we can use this command, um, basically, which writes this uh, E016 at this particular memory address. And this basically overrides all the instructions of the, of the signature check function. Which means, so what's the consequence of that? Well, if we supply uh, U-Boot with malicious config, what it will do is it will basically ask U-Boot to patch itself very nicely which will disable the verify uh, function so we can start to modify the kernel. B if because we have modified the kernel, we can basically disable the ELF signature verification and we can disable the root file system verification. And from there, we can just pull out the keys from opt and you know, we have everything compromised basically at this point. So we can run our own kernels, we can run our own file systems. So what we did, what we did achieve with that method generally, well, we bypassed the secure boot process, uh, we can modify the kernel, we can remove all these checks which are in there, um, we can also disable as Elinos, which sometimes gets a little bit annoying, and we can modify the root file system. Um, from there, we can start to install custom software and get SSH access. Um, one quick comment here is uh, it's not limited only on all winner SOC, so this attack method surprisingly um, works for many, many other devices. So uh, I tested it on other robots, I tested it on smart speakers, I tested it on media devices, so this works generally wherever you have U-Boot. You can use the memory commands to just overwrite and patch U-Boot itself, basically, as long as you have access to somehow to the environment partition. Which brings us to the next problem. So how can we modify the environment partition? So, the problem is without root access, we cannot modify it for obvious reasons. Um, and we cannot also modify root file system if you don't have shell access to the device. And one thing which I can do, but probably most of the people in here can't do, is like to disorder the flash memory, which is kind of a little bit dangerous and will definitely void your warranty. So the good news is I figured out a way to do that for each of the devices. So um, for the uh, old P models, we have a new method, which is the USB stick method, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, for the newer devices, uh, we use like FEL boot, so we get it into bootloader. And for the, all the Roblox devices, um, we have a thing which we call scary FEL boot, and I will explain why it's scary. So as a quick uh, recap for people who saw the presentation two years ago, um, Dreamy is very, very nice and gave us like, lots of the bug pins, which are accessible without completely disassembling the device. You just need to basically remove a cover and you have access there. And all the new devices have exactly the same pinout, so you can just, you know, if you have like a routing adapter, which you can get today for free here, if I have still some left, um, you can just connect to that and you get access to a UART, USB, and some other things. So uh, let's talk about the USB stick method. Um, 
So uh, Dreamy left um, a back drawer in all the P models for whatever reason. I think they just forgot about that. There's a, there's a script which gets executed as soon as atta you attach an empty USB stick. Um, and this is how it looks like. So basically, if you attach an empty USB stick, there's a function which will try to check something. But as you see, this function is basically doing exactly the same thing. It will pop a, a login shell. So if you just attach an empty USB stick, they forgot to do the actual authentication. So you have a, a shell, and from there you can just do the old methods of routing. Very, very easy. Um, and so after login, you can just patch the environment and install custom software. It's super trivial. Uh, the sad news is, apparently for the new models, we didn't forget that. So I assume they have two branches, which at some point separated. They did the uh, implementation of the authentication in the new models, but they forgot to patch it back. So uh, they have, I think, some, some weird issues with their, um, with their code management. Um, for the new um, Ruberock models, um, we have this method FEL boot, um, FEL root, and basically what it does is um, we need to use some adapter, we need to use a cable to just get it into bootloader mode, so we need to short uh, the boot selection pin down to ground, and then we have a custom Phoenix Suite image, which will basically um, give, you, give us a um, fast boot interface to access the flash memory, so it's, kinda, it's actually not really a firmware update, it's kind of like a weird sketchy thing which got zombie together out of different parts, which barely works, but it works per perfectly fine for whatever we try to do. So what it allows us to automatically patch the, the, the bootloader and the environment, and it allows us to send the, the root file system and the kernel onto the robot via USB. So, and it's very, very safe. So, so far we had zero bricked robots, and even if the robot is bricked, we can recover any robot by doing this method without erasing data, which has existed before. Um, there's a how-to. Um, on my website, um, which you can just uh, look at, um, it's, it's pic with pic lots of pictures, so it should be very trivial. If you want to get uh, adapters, um, there's some Gerber files online, uh, but you also can get some from me. I have some, still some parts left, so in case you're interested, just hit me up. Let's talk about the uh, scary FL route. Um, so the problem with which we have with Roborock, they're a little bit smarter. They don't uh, give us any debug pins outside, except for USB. And um, so you know, I got a little bit desperate. So the first approach, which I typically do, is I need to completely tear the device down. So I, I spend $1,000, get the device assembled, like remove the PCB. One thing which I typically do is I remove also the main processor, which is like 400 something pins, and start to map out um, where the tracks are going. Um, I remove also the EMMC on the backside um, and do the same thing. So then the big question is like, okay, I take both pictures, put them above each other in my favorite hacking tool, MS Paint, and uh, look at the data sheet and just map down, okay, where are the pins? So you see there, I started to kind of map down, like, oh, okay, I have like uh, RX, TX, FEL, I have like the data lines of the, of the UART. And uh, the same thing I do in, at the front, so basically I run all the things down and uh, b figure out where are the traces for what, so that I have some idea. And one of the things I noticed is actually, I can I can get access to all the MMC data lines and pins which I need to access EMMC memory from the holes of the buttons. So basically, I will just do a quick thing, even though I don't have that much time. Uh, basically, if you just assemble the device, you just remove, uh, without disassembling the device, you just remove the one cover and you remove the rubber cover and you can access everything from this hole without just touching any screws on the back. So you don't need to disassemble the device, you don't um, trash any warranty seals, you can access everything from the holes of the buttons. I think my presentation is gone. This is my laptop. Okay, no, okay. let me, sorry about that. Okay. This is a faster way to do that, actually. <laughs> All right, I, I promise uh, I will be very quick for the last five minutes because I'm running a little bit of the time. Um, okay, so the good news was uh, that I can access all the holes from uh, all the pins from. I am so sorry. I promise it worked better at DEF CON. Okay. Why is it scary? Uh, basically, um, we can root the device now without um, um, the teardown. We can access it from uh, under the cover, and it applies both for S8 and S8 Pro Ultra. 
Um, what we can do with that is if you short the data zero pin to ground at boot up, it can't load the file system so, uh, or the, 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 even the bootloader and it will go into bootloader mode, which is kind of great for us. And then you can just flash it again over USB. So it's basically the same approach as for the L10 Ultra or, or the ARM models. And there will be also on how, to, um, how to do that very easily. Um, the question is why is it scary? And the scary part is you need to kind of basically find where the trace is, and I kind of marked it in this presentation. And you need to scratch off the solder mask and access the copper trace. I would give you a demonstration, but I think I'm running definitely out of time. So uh, maybe hit me up later and I can just show you with a microscope how to do that. Um, don't do this method, by the way, if you feel uncomfortable. As an alternative, you can still tear it down. So before you break your device, it might be safer to disassemble it and just connect to the actual pin on the back of the, of the main board. Um, if unsure, please ask others. Uh, there's a Telegram group where a lot of people did already a lot of exper uh, like experiments of that and uh, did it on their own, so they know how to do that. Um, for the other robot models, a little bit more complicated. So sadly, for most robots, um, the process is more or less the same, but um, we cannot access the, the flash or the bug pins from outside, so you need to disassemble them. Um, here, the alternative way to get into FAL mode is to basically connect over UART and press to um, you know uh, press uh, the, the keyboard to uh, while basically accessing it. Uh, you can check out also my website robot uh, robot robotinfo.dev for the pinouts um, or again ask in the community. So for the last few slides, what can we do with root access? So what do we have now? So we have secure boot defeated. Uh, we can run custom software, but what kind of software can we run? Um, and the question is, can we you know, build something of our own with like, um, as an operation system with SLAM, navigation, and AI models? Well, to do our own software is a little bit complicated, so the, our main idea is, like, can we just disconnect the device from the cloud and just keep all the vendor logic in place and just you know, run you know, with the original software? So one of the questions is, is like, what, what kind of different ways we can we do that? Some people think we can just disconnect the cloud um, this will make the robot work in most cases, like if you press the buttons, but you will lose the features like live maps uh, or advanced features in map editing. And why rooting the device if we just basically lose all this functionality? So instead, what we try to do is like we try to redirect the cloud traffic to our own software. And for that, we need to extract some firmware secrets and to basically you know, point it to like a fake cloud emulation. So let's talk quickly about replacing the cloud. Um, the initial approach which we had was to redirect DNS traffic. Um, and this was kind of easy. We were just changing the host files and or use IP tables to reroute that. Sadly, Xiaomi, who runs the ecosystem, the backend, kind of figured that out. And so what we did is like they started to introduce some counter measurements, and they basically hard coded IP addresses in the cloud binary, uh, which was a little bit mean because that means that DNS redirection doesn't work anymore. Inst our counter measurement was basically we, you know countermeasured their stuff, we just replaced their hard-coded IP addresses with our hard-coded IP addresses and you know it was just working fine. So this allowed us to run Valetudo, which is like the custom software which is developed by uh, Zoom, and it completely replaces the cloud and the vendor apps. It runs locally in a robot, so you have like one package which has everything in it, like on the robot itself. Um, it features everything which the cloud offers you, like full um, the robot control, live maps, map editing, the robot configuration. It has a responsive um, web interface. Um, and it works both in uh, mobile and desktop. It gives you also REST API and the MQTT functionality, which is important for people who run home automation software. Um, the weird thing, choice from, um, from Zern was basically to use uh, embedded JavaScript. There might be something more performant, but I mean, it works. These devices are powerful enough. Anyway, um, to give you some ideas how this looks like, I mean, it's a very nice um, interface and it gives you, you know, all the functionality which you need. Um, one thing, how do you get um, you know, cus the custom software generated. There's a website called Dustbooter, and one of the reasons why I created this website was basically that Mac users started to break their devices because Macs are kind of behaving a little bit weird how to they unpack file systems and repack them again. So I just want to avoid the support cases and just, you know, um, have a website which takes care of that. So um, basically with this website, you can build your own uh, f um, um, robot firmwares, and uh, they most of the time reproducible builds. Uh, it's easy to use. It works for Dreamy, Roborock, and Biomi, and some others. Um, if you don't trust it, uh, the scripts are online on GitHub. You can just do it in themselves. You just need the firmware file, which we can't provide you out of legal reasons. But if you're interested in that, uh, you can go to this website. All right, um, there's a couple more interesting things, but I think I will get t t torn down by from the... Let me maybe quickly go through that. Exactly. We have a proposal for you guys. Um, 
as the time has elapsed already and due to technical issues, we already are five minutes over. We just want to give everybody the opportunity to go to the next talk, perhaps. Um, however, as this stage uh, will only continue uh, at 12.30 with a movie night with war games, um, which you could definitely have a watch, um, we want to also give you the opportunity to share and demonstrate, especially the robots you brought here, <laughs> until um, 12 o'clock. Yeah, I think it's if that's fine for the crowd. <laughs> Looks like it, so please continue. All right. Um, yeah, sorry for the technical issues. I, I tested everything before, but uh, you never know. Anyway, what kind of interesting things did we find? Well, we have some camera access. All the devices use the video for Linux uh, sub subsystem for their cameras. So if you have root access on the device, you can just talk to the cameras via the, the device nodes, like video zero, video one. And some of the vendors were even so nice and left us uh, debugging tools for the cameras, like Camera Demo, which is an opener tool where you can just pull pictures and configurations from the camera. So um, let me show you some examples from the optical sensors. Um, on the, this is like the Roborock uh, G10S, which is mostly used in China and I think in Russia and some other Eastern European states because we can get it cheaper. Uh, on the left, you see the robot seeing itself in the mirror. So some philosophical picture, basically. And on the right is some example of the you know, output. Um, Dreamy is a little bit better. It has a better, nicer cameras. Uh, so on the left, you see the Dreamy L10S Ultra, again, in the mirror. Uh, and on the right, you see one of the pictures which it does use for object detection. This is in our lab in Boston. So um, this is the kind of quality of pictures you get nowadays. Um, this is one where um, I, uh, this is from the S S8. Basically, on the left, it's a little bit weird because I, I think I, I didn't have the exposure correctly. Uh, on the right, you see uh, my blue elephant, which I left in the tent, I think. Um, so it's not blue here because it has like an infrared camera, so it, it sees basically just in black and white. Right. Um, let's talk about quick findings uh, which we found at Dreamy. So last time, if people saw the last time presentation, you might have uh, seen some very sketchy things which were left in firmware. Goodness, good news this time, they didn't leave SSH credentials to the backend service in the firmware this time, so that was good um, for them, I assume. They made us a lot of improvements in the software, so the software is more stable, it's more clean, which is also very good for us. Um, one of the bad news is that they introduced a lot of like calling home functions and started to enforce geo-blocking by IP addresses. So they introduced a lot of functions where they would detect if you um, grab uh, if you buy a cheap device in, in China and use it anywhere else, um, and I think vice versa. So there's kind of some weird stuff going on. Um, also, one quick thing is um, many robots will detect where we are. Uh, Roborock does it, Dreamy does it, and a couple com other companies do that too. If you're, for example, in America, uh, they will disable some functions in the software, basically. So you don't have edge cleaning anymore if you um, are in the US, or if it detects that it's in the US. And part of the reason is apparently that iRobot has patents on that which expire, I think, next year. So I would expect that this function gets enabled magically next year. Also, some devices have a dust sensor to, the test, to, to test how dusty the air is, but it's not enabled in software because iRobot has, again, a patent on that which expires next year. So I think it's kind of weird patent stuff. So uh, in case of you wondering why they so live it about uh, geoblocking, it's one of these uh, this legal reasons also. So um, the other thing is uh, Dreamy robots and also other robots support camera monitoring, so you can watch your pets remotely. Um, and for legal reasons, most of the time, if you're uh, for actually all the devices, if you enable the remote camera feature, it will warn you via voice prompt and say, like, oh, camera monitoring is enabled, and it will repeat that every um, three minutes or so. Um, the, uh, this is, I think, a legal requirement in many, many countries. And um, so, yeah. Um, one of the um, things is that these voice prompts need obviously to be localized. So, for example, you don't want to hear like a um, you know English voice prompt if you're in Germany and some other things. So, the, uh, these audio files are part of an externally um, downloaded uh, audio pack. The problem with this audio pack is they are not signed or encrypted. So, basically, you can just override the audio prompt, like this warning audio prompt, with an empty file and basically push it onto the device and just disable this prompt and you can spy on people, which is probably, I think, a little bit illegal, so don't do that again. Uh, um, that's uh, probably very illegal in Germany, I think. Um, and uh, the, the important p aspect here is it works on all devices, not only rooted devices, so be a little bit careful if you get device from somewhere else. Um, 
One of the biggest fails I saw so far for a very long time was how they sign their signatures. So um, I, I think this is part of a panic process which we had last year or two years ago. Um, so new uh, robots um, um, of Dreamy encrypt and sign the firmware, but in a very weird way. So the firmware payload looks like this. So you have an outside zip archive, which is encrypted with a static password, which is different for each of the models. Then they have a random file, uh, which is signed with a private key by Dreamy, which you don't have. Um, and then you have a zip archive in, in inside, which is encrypted with the random file as the password. Well, what's the problem here? Well, the actual firmware is not signed, only the password is. So basically, they signed the password, but they didn't sign the, the, um, you know, the actual firmware. So you can basically create your fake firmware update by just re reusing the password which we used before. Uh, as an analogy, what I would say is, imagine you could prove that the phone is yours if the pin on the phone is the same as yours. So it's kind of like if I have a po phone which has the password 1234, well, actually, now that I think about it, the analogy is kind of weird, but okay, it's a huge problem, so that's a very, very huge fail. So basically, you can create your own firmware updates, um, which are correctly signed in a way um, without um, the, the private key of Dreamy because we just signed the password and not the actual firmware. All right, as a summary, finally, um, so we have routing methods for most of the current release Dreamy uh, Ro and Roborock models, so we can bypass secure boot, uh, we can bypass any other security mechanism. Uh, we have persistence, we can um, run our own custom software. Now we can validate and verify vendor claims, which, so, which is a very good thing. This is probably what the TÜV should have done some time ago. Um, and the bootloader attack is also pliable to many, many other devices. So if you have smart speakers and they run U-Boot, then just take a quick look into that if you can you know, manipulate that. Um, and this, uh, this whole routing method basically allows us also to do uh, further research into IoT and I AI. Um, as some final notes, um, please don't use the knowledge for bad things. Uh, if you do routing, pl um, please help others uh, if they need help with routing. Uh, not many people are kind of uh, feeling comfortable with doing that. Uh, especially if you have routing PCBs, uh, feel free to share them in your hackerspace. Um, the tools mo are mostly pu published already, but there, there's some, still some work to do because uh, I was a little bit busy over the next couple of days, uh, over the last couple of days. So uh, if there's something not published yet, please be patient, this will be published very soon. Um, if you're interested in more vacuum robot hacking uh, or flash forensics, uh, you can join me at the hardware in the Netherlands, which is in the beginning of November. Um, there might or might not be a talk maybe about vacuum robots again, uh, this, this time not about Roborock or uh, Dreamy, so uh, we will see. So, some acknowledgements. Um, I want to thank uh, Danny Wigema, Givano Beer, Sören Bayer, and Mikael Kolkin, and obviously also all the testers in the community. And yeah, that's my presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me um, on via Telegram, Twitter, or email. And thank you very much. Um, I can also do a quick demonstration of the microscope if you're interested or you're interested. All right, okay. Um, let me just change to the camera. By the way, the camp is very dusty, as you can see, these robots are not meant for being on a camp. So, as mentioned before, um, for the Roborock it's a little bit sketchy, or a little bit scary, because you have to basically um, remove the, uh, the cover, which is very easy, you can just remove it, and you have here the, um, the plastic part, uh, the rubber part. And then you need to find the trace. Oh, oops. As you see, um, uh, CS people are always tricky. All right. Now, uh, let me just change it real quick. So, this is the left button, basically. And as you can see in a second, we have there a trace. which is basically here comes the VR out and then goes through here and goes there. So one thing which you can do to basically root it, you take like something pointy, you don't want to cut it, you want, just want to scrape off the, the trace a little bit. So you take it and you find it any way here and you just start to scratch. And at some point, if, so if you use a knife, just scratch it, don't cut it, please. 
and at some point you will see the copper and that should be more or less enough to kind of hold it down for like in the, in the moment when you power the device on it will go into bootloader mode. So just scratch a little bit. I, I know it looks scary and you need to have some very good eyes if you have a microscope that's bonus points but uh, you might use also phone and as you can see a little bit you see like it's already now the copper and that's enough you just need to have like a very short contact it's, it's not mission critical basically to you know keep keep it in in place actually do i see the copper let me yeah i can scratch even a little bit more it's a little bit tricky to do it on camera the more effort you put into that the less is, it's visible all right i think it should be Okay, just imagine that you see the copper there. You should see at some point the copper. Again, don't cut the trace, uh, but you can scratch it off anywhere you want. For uh, the other devices, it's a little bit easier. The, the scary aspect of like um, routing the Dreamy devices is to remove the cover, and it, it will feel wrong because you need to use a lot of force. And because I did that already probably 50 times for these ones, this is easier, but at some point, it just comes off and you have the, the buck pins very, very nicely here. So uh, from a routing perspective, Dreamy is great, but nowadays we can also root Roborock. So it's kind of like, I mean, you're not limited to one company or the other. You can just uh, um, decide freely. Uh, all right. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them probably after this thing outside. I uh, have a bag of couple routing adapters left. Uh, sorry for the technical issues. Um, it worked for me before, but I mean, you never know. It's, it's computer stuff. Um, all right, thank you very much for being here, and thank you very much for your patience.